Good evening, everybody. I trust that um, everybody's well on this Friday. Happy Orange Friday to all and everyone. Um, grateful to be sharing live this evening. Um, grateful to be sober first and foremost. Grateful to have a program that I practice each and every day that keeps me sober. Grateful to be surrounded by people that love and care about me. <coughs> that empowers my life each and every day. That gives me that hard discipline. That hard correction that I need daily. Correction that I didn't want to take before. That got me into trouble. Trouble that's so bad that was killing myself and my family along. And I think... Um, Sometimes when I take my inventory, I always go back to, like we are taught you on the phone when we do our shit then. Is to always go back to, um, how grateful we need to be to get out of a certain emotion or a certain struggle that we are going in. <coughs> and one of those things that are on top of our list is to be sober. On my list is to be sober. So, yeah, I greet everybody once again. Um, you all know who I am. My name is Adrian. I'm a recovering addict in Powering Lives. Um, currently on the rail farm. Um, got a job now. To those that doesn't know, I started working. Um, I work outside of rail for a company called Ortex. It's a signing company. It's a job that Mr. All once again got me. In this program, that's simply just to do mix writing. Um, it's simply through people that trusted and believed in me, like Mr. O, like Mr. Shula, and like my family that supports me today. And um, I enjoy what I do. I was telling uh, Graham earlier this evening when he came to pick me up from work, he asked me how was my day. I told him I had such a liquor day, I didn't want to stop working. <coughs> that um, they told me I need to go home now when I told them I want to do the next job let's move on to the next thing and I think um, that simply comes from me working here on the farm as well when I was in the program okay there we go we're back sorry about that must have been a network error I can't see any comments so good evening to everybody that is greeting me um, <laughs> To all love to everybody. I'm not getting any feeds, crumbs. Are oh, okay. should be. Oh, Venus is this is Facebook Lite because he doesn't have the original Facebook. <laughs> but whether it's light or not, we're still sharing this evening. We're still doing what we need to do. <coughs> How's it, Angus? I oh. saw you in a long time. Okay. Angus is one of my Ham brothers that is on the farm also. Love Angus to bits. Where he's come from and what he's busy doing now. He's doing the most important job on this farm. And it's taking care of Mr. Hall's mom. And that's simply through him working the program as well. Every day when I watch what he does, I get a message out of what he does. And it keeps me sober. It's not so I'm going to have a long meeting this evening, not really much I'm going to talk about. Um, good evening Mr. Shula, if you are out there. Good evening to the guys that are out with you as well. Hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. And um, come back home safely as well. And um, Mr. Shula, thank you for every, each and everything that you do for us. Thank you for believing in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. Thank you to Mr. Also believing in me even when I didn't believe in myself. The time and the effort that you guys take out of and investing in people's lives, it's priceless. And um, it's not anybody that can take on what you do. It's something that can be taught. It's not something that can be studied. It's simply just a passion that is there that keeps you alive and that keeps you sober each and every day. And when I see that passion, when I see that fire, it's something that I want. And that's why we put the effort in and the work in, in our program that we work. 
so that the results can stand out for itself. And obviously, um, one of the, the gifts that are important to me in my recovery that I'm going to speak about this evening is simply that spiritual awakening. And it's funny how I'm speaking about this this evening because today at work, I encountered a situation where I had to practice a certain spiritual principle in my program while I was at work, yes, because uh, it's not when you go to work your program it's not when you step out of rehabilitation and you've done your six months people think that you stop working a program you finish you're done you're never going to go back to using drugs i promise you if you stop working your program or stop working the spiritual progress the spiritual pr um, principles in your program or even simply compromise on spiritual principles do not practice it in all your fees you eventually gonna pick up on drugs and alcohol trust me i know i've tried every way i've tried every loophole I've tried cutting corners that only eventually let me cut short in my recovery because a relapse is not an accident or anything like it. It's not part of recovery, it's a lack of recovery like Mr. Schuller says. And a relapse is a reality and it does happen. There's a lot of people that is falling and that's why I'm so passionate about it now. That's why that fire is in me. I thought I lost it out there. But it comes back as you work your program, your, your, your spiritual principles come back, you get a spiritual awakening in certain. Thank you, Vena. This is my um, sort of like a cigarette because I don't smoke anymore. Thanks to God. Thanks to this rail program. I gave up cigarettes for the second time when I came up to the farm. And... Um, yeah, like I said, if, if, you, if you're not doing or compromising on, on your program and you're not working it solidly and properly and you forget where you come from and you stop doing the thing, yeah, it's back. Yeah. Like I said, you compromise on anything that you do, you eventually will pick up. <coughs> and a lot of people are falling out there because they don't have a program to follow. There's no support that is out there that is solid enough to keep them sober. And those are one of the things that I'm grateful for when I come from work, that I come back into a safe environment. Because it's easy for me also to think in my mind, maybe I don't need to be in a safe environment, maybe I don't need to come back, maybe I don't need to be surrounded by, by like-minded people that are on the same mission that I'm on, that are supporting and helping me throughout the recovery. Maybe I can still maybe do it on my own. And where did all those maybes get me? <laughs> those maybes got me into a definite situation where I was killing myself back on the streets back and it is back sorry about that connection error yeah so back on the streets back to robbing people back to stealing from people back to lying to my family back to lying to myself ah you know the same old same old man that doesn't change at all it just gets much more deeper into that rabbit hole um, when you start picking up and going down that hole because nothing has changed out there there's nothing I'm missing out at this moment and um, when I see someone struggling in their recovery, when they think that, you know, the outside world might be better. Back again. Yeah, maybe you could have been with your family, like I said. Maybe they want to go out there, they want to get a job, they want to get on with their lives. Trust me and believe in me, I also want to do the same thing, my brother. But the most important thing that I need to first do is to work on my recovery. And to make sure that I'm in a safe environment for myself. Because I self-destruct me. I self And it's back again. Okay. So like I said, uh, I, I self-destruct me. I self- You're saying this. Can any worry. Sorry, glad one, my brother. You know, you must like to speak loud and laugh. But can say for me. Ik is ultimate. Ik is ultimate. And where did ultimate get me into Gladwin? <laughs> Got me into trouble, my brother. Yeah, but like I said, <clears throat> I self-destruct. Everything I touch, everything I do, eventually rots and it breaks down if I'm not working a program and I'm not in the recovery. Uh, Mr. Ho has a saying, we says, and Mr. Shula also, and one of the gifts in, of recovery that it gives you, you might have 10 cars or 7 cars, but you can only drive one car at a time, which is fine. At least you have a car. But when you're active and you use drugs, you drive none cars. The cars drive past you rather. And um, 
I was just experience um, loved ones driving past me when they see me, you know, and they just go on and they go on with their daily lives. And I would sit with that guilt and that resentment, like, yo, how can they drive past me? I'm their family. What do they think about me? But a couple of 24 hours ago, I forget that that was the same loved one that I maybe stole something from, that I lied to, that I took money from, that I stole jewelry from or stole the geezer from. When they opened up the tap, there was no hot water for them to shower or to wash. Because when they opened up the cover and the plumber came to check the geezer, <coughs> they saw there wasn't any more geezer. And they drive past me and I'm thinking to myself, how can they do this to me? They can see I'm struggling on the road, I'm on the streets. Why can't they help me, you know? <coughs> How could they help someone at the time they didn't want to be helped? When I was practicing a program of insanity again, that made me did insane things, that made me thought I was right. The insane part of everything that I did that was wrong, I thought I was right, that I was, that I was doing. Drugs humiliated me. Active addiction humiliated me. And it had to humiliate me. I had to go through that humiliation to be humbled. To be humble because I thought I was. That's lovely. Yeah, so so moving on swiftly, like I said, <clears throat> one of my most important and the best gifts of my recovery is my spiritual awakening that I found in working 12 steps of, of um, AA and NA. And it didn't come easy, you know, when I came even back the second time to, to the real farm, I remember I was sleeping on the couch. And um, Mr. Shula put on some spiritual music because that's what we do every morning here on the farm. We have our quiet time and our devotions and we have time and we make time for God. Because without you know, and I'm back, without God in our recovery, we can't stay sober. <clears throat> and I sat there that morning and Mr. Shula put on some spiritual music. Now before I went out, to go and pick up, I used to love my devotions, I used to love my devotional music, you know. I loved, I love making time for God and everything, I love God, I still do. And um, when that music was playing, that spirit of discernment was in me. My spiritual condition was so messed up that I didn't, I couldn't respond to it, I was despondent to it, man, you know. The music was playing and I just wanted to flee away from it because I knew it deep inside this, this feeling that, that emptiness, that ah uh, feeling, you know. Not the liquor feeling, you know. Because when people hear God or when they hear spiritual thing or they, when they hear pastor or when they hear church, they get feared or they get chased away because they think they have to, you know, this is how it is. And rechop and pangster and tai and everything like that. When the Bible simply says you need to come as you are, man. God loves you just the way you are because He made you perfect in His image, ultimately. And as I found... Um, me spending more time with God and having devotions every morning and, and listening to that spiritual music, that peace and serenity slowly came back, but it didn't come back that easily. There were certain steps I had to take that I had to be willing to take again to get to a certain point in my recovery, to get exactly what Graham has in his recovery. Everything that drugs and alcohol promised him, sobriety has given him. And I've seen that in Graham's life and I wanted that. And I fought for it. And I got that peace and that serenity back now. But just because I got it back doesn't mean it can go away again. That's what I learned out of my relapse. Because the moment I stop doing what I am supposed to do in my program, that's the moment I work a 12-step program of insanity again and I become dry. And eventually when you be, do become dry, you have to get wet, like Mr. Stoll says. And then I find myself back to where I come from very easily so each and every day I have to check myself and like I said to the story that I'm coming back to at work I encountered one of those uh, spiritual principles that I had to practice in my recovery because first I'm not at work I'm in recovery and then everything else falls afterwards into what it's supposed to fall into but First and foremost, I need to remember and remind myself that I'm in recovery. And everything that I have now that is balanced out in my life is because I am in recovery. Because I found God in recovery again. And um, I encountered one of the customers and the customer wanted a certain thing from me. And there were two ways I could have gone about it. I could have, which is the right way which I did do, which was 
I was thinking of going the wrong way first, but the right way was for me simply just to fix what the customer asked he had a problem with. Or, I could have lied and manipulated the customer to buy something from me, just so I can make whatever means I could make. And tell the customer, you know, that thing is not working anymore, that's why you need this. Now, I put myself into the customer's shoes because when I go to a shop, I also want the best service. I also want to be helped. And I wouldn't want someone to lie to me if they can help me with a certain thing. Simply, I, I don't want to be put a cop on me. And that's what I could come back and there we go, we're back. Yeah. And um, like I said, you don't want to be put a cop on, you know. You want to be treated fairly and, and helped properly. And because I practice a program of honesty... I did the honest and the right thing to help that client and to fix what could have been fixed without lying to them or anything for them for me to just make a sale. I fixed it and I went back to my boss and I told my boss, you know what I encountered now? Uh, I could have sold this, but I didn't do it because why? First and foremost, like I said, I'm in recovery and I'm surrounded by people that supports me at my work as well in my recovery that understands what I'm going through. How beautiful is that, man? They don't question it. They know exactly where this boy is at and what this man is but this young man is doing and what his mission is and they support me fully on that you know i'm still connected but that's another human being like i said <clears throat> and um yeah my, i went back to my boss and i told my boss you know this is what um this is what I faced with and I could have done it the wrong way but I, I decided to do it the right way and simply because I did it the right way this is how God works in my recovery and in my program that I'm working he sent along other people that needed what, exactly what I was selling I eventually made the sales and the floodgates opened when I made the sales that there wasn't enough stock for me to start selling what I was supposed to sell simply because and I believe it was a test <clears throat> simply because of of, of How I help that person genuinely out of the pure goodness of my heart and my recovery that I'm working in my program. And that is one of the per spiritual principles because if I had compromised there, listen to what I'm saying. If I had compromised there and thought to myself, you know what, it's okay, it's for business. Okay, maybe it's for business, it's fine. But I would have sat with that guilty feeling and come back home with that guilty feeling like, yeah, I did something wrong and I know I did something wrong. And it would have eaten me up inside out. That I would have been sitting with it, with it, with it. Back again, my mates is having connection problems over there. Okay, so I'm just going to read um, out of the recovery book. And in the reading over here is Awakening to our, our Spirituality. We are not the only people who have spiritual awakenings. But there is a particular awakening we experience as a result of working the steps. We are newly alive to the world around us. We see more clearly and feel more accurately. And that isn't always comfortable. And then I'm back. So apologies, guys. It's something that's happening that is out of my control, but the only thing in my control is for me to be sitting in the seat this evening and to still carry the message. So some of our members believe that the most important spiritual awakening occurs when we walk into recovery. And we spend the rest of our recovery trying to understand what happened. For others of us, the awakening, like so much else in recovery, seems to happen in layers. The fog pulled back to where I could see how much uh, the fog was in my eye. And I'm back here. Yeah? So I was the fog pulled back to where I could see how much fog there was. And that's true, when you step into the doors and when I walked in here, you're so broken inside and then things start happening, you start building up and you start seeing things realizing how the scales were over your eyes of everything that you've done. And it starts coming off and you start taking your inventory deeply and you start taking responsibility for your actions. And that responsibility results in... Okay, I'm back again, apologies about that. So like I said, yeah, that's the fog that comes out of our eyes and we're not clouded and we're not seeing things through our drugged eyes and, uh, and uh, under the influence or we have this whole paranoia and this whole epiphany in our mind that everybody else was wrong and nobody caused, I never caused any wrong, you know. 
Because when I stepped into recovery, that's what I thought in the beginning. I never caused any wrong. My family were wrong to me, and that's why I turned to drugs. My baby mama was wrong to me, that's why I turned to drugs. Even to blame my son, even to blame my father, man. Everybody else was wrong but Adrian. But for once, Adrian sees now where Adrian's part in everything that happened to Adrian lies. And it starts with Adrian. Some of us have awakened spirituality with an overwhelming sense of power greater than ourselves. Others have shared a slow, gentle reviving of spiritual awareness. Whether or not we ever experience a sense of a higher power, HP. Now when I word of a word, higher power, HP in the meetings, in the inner meetings, I thought when someone said that, you know, uh, let's uh, allow our HPs to come in here, I was thinking, yeah, well, these laptops gonna come in here because... Okay, and I'm back. Like I said, others have shared a slow, gentle revival, reviving of spiritual awareness. Whether or not we ever experience a sense of higher power, the discovery that others care about us can be a spiritual awakening. Now that's a big one. Because for me, I thought nobody cared about me when I grew up. My mother never cared about me, she put me out, how can my mommy do this to me? Tony never cared about me when she left me for another man. Okay, and I'm back again. Yeah, I was on, Tony left me for another man. She's wrong, how can she do this to me? My son is probably calling him daddy. No, 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 my son knows who his father is. I'm his daddy. Um, my mom has moved on with her life. How can she move on with her life? She's a, a world supposed to be revo uh, revolved around me. I'm a son, she's supposed to care for me. You know, I thought people, they just threw me away like I was nothing. And I thought they never cared about me until I realized that it was tough love that was shown to me, that had to be shown to me, that saved my life. Because if my mother was still soft today, I don't think I would have seek the help. I think that the enabling would have still happened, that eventually would have pushed me. And I'm back again. Yeah, so like I said, I thought nobody cared about me until I realized that tough love had to be shown to me. My mother stopped enabling me, and that saved my life. And when I saw that tough love, and I still see it today, I get it first hand from Mr. Stoll and Mr. Shula, I get it first hand from the leadership, you know, from the people that care about me. Tough love, and that hard discipline, you know, and that showing care about me, that they don't want to see me go down <clears throat> anymore. They just want to help me to be a better person every day. And that's a spiritual awakening that I got for myself as well, that people start to care about me. And I'm back again. Apologies about that. We're just experiencing some <coughs> difficulty with the connections here yeah, that I'm on and off. But yeah, in return, because of people caring about me, I started to have that some sort of care for things. And it started with small, simple things. And then it moved on to bigger things again. And now that I show that care, that's one of the reasons why I'm sitting here this evening to carry the message to the still suffering addict out there. Because I know exactly what they're feeling, I know exactly what they're going through. And like the stigma that's attached to them, people think they're bad. Hey, thank you very much guys for your patience, and I'm back again. Okay. So the discovery that others care about us can be a spiritual awakening. For the first time we recognize that we matter. Living according to the principle leads us to humility, a greater awareness of our place in the world and our ability to live comfortably in it. We often hear at meetings the most important thing to understand about God is that you are not God. Yo! Now that knocks you over completely because I thought I was God. Like I used to tell Gladwin when he used to be here, Ken sy for my ekes ultimate. I thought I was that ultimate person. I know everything, you know. Until God showed me who God is and how He works. But He also showed me how much He loves me. Whatever it takes for us to realize that we are not the center of the universe, it's worth it. We may be too clever to declare ourselves a supreme being, but our self-centered disease still tells us that we are responsible for much more than we could possibly control. 
Now that's a self-centered part of our disease that, 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 that we struggle with, where we still think, you know, I still got certain things in my control, I still have my hand on some things, and those are things we need to let go, because if we don't let, and I'm back again, apologies about that, yeah, like it says, in this book here, like I said, to, um, I thought I was important, I thought I was God, you know, and the more I wanted to control something, the more I felt that sense of power that I was in control. But I had to learn the hard way that I'm not in control. Because I my life until I was killing myself with the poison and the stuff and the situations that I was putting myself in. It was the life of addiction. When we practice living in harmony with our world, we become wiser about choosing our battles. We learn we can use our energy to make a difference. There we go. Good evening. I'm back again. Sorry about the disconnection. I'm using Graham the Greats. And you can hear the great, the Greats phone. So obviously, this should be better. There shouldn't be any influences now. <clears throat> My battery's going to die. So we've got like 15 minutes. I've got 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So I won't be long in sharing. in harmony with our world we become wiser about choosing our battles we learn where we can use our energy to make a difference and where we need to let go that's the beauty of working this program i now know and i now know what i need to let go of and you know how that sense of peace and serenity is inside of me when i let go and i allow god to step in and to do his work when I allow God to take over and God to take the wheel over because He does a job better than anybody else. And that's the peace and that serenity inside of Him. Learning to step away from a conflict once it has started is sometimes harder than not getting into conflicts at all. Now, I was one of the last say in everything. I always conflict with someone, I always had an argument with someone, I always questioned something, you know, I always had to be right. And it was difficult for me to walk away from conflict, man. But now with the 12 step program that I'm working with, the spiritual awakening I have, I now realize I don't need to go through that conflict, I don't need to put myself into situations anymore where I still feel that I need to take on this battle, man. you know. Because now I have the most ultimate weapon that is fighting the battle for me, that I'm winning. That I'm winning and it's God, man. And because with Him, I'm fighting this battle, that's the reason why I'm still winning. And that doesn't mean that we always agree with anyone or everything. Or that we suddenly lose the power to stand up for what is right. Now, because I walk away and I step away from that conflict, doesn't mean that I'm weak and that I'm... You know, some sort of person that cannot stand up for himself. I just now have the backbone to handle situations in the right way. But the spine also in my backbone to stand up for what is right, man. And to say, you know, how many times I please and just walk over me when I should have stood up for myself. Walk over me, they technically walking over my family, my son and everybody else with me because I'm allowing them to do that. So just, be, just because I, I practice a program where I can walk away from unnecessary conflict doesn't mean I don't have to stand up for myself anymore. Struggles are worth fighting, even though our victory is sure. This is discernment, and it comes from our experience. We the difference between a principle we need to stand for and, a, and an opinion that we just need to let go of. We are able to up and win to surrender now that word surrender ultimately and as we practice we get a bit we get better at determining which is right for us and that's simply through surrender the only way i win is through daily surrender and i have to surrender daily i have to surrender that the recovery is done to my issue and my problem each and every day this is not a, re a resignation. This is not a program of a certain duration of time that you do it and you walk away from it. When you walk with God, you're either hot for Him and you stand up for Him and you believe in what is right and say what is right at the time or you simply just walk away from it. There's no in-betweens with God, man. It's like having a cup of coffee 
Do you like your cup of coffee cold? Or do you like it hot? Now for God and when you work this program, you gotta be hot for it. Or cold, you can't be in between. There's no in between, there's no gray areas in recovery like Mr. Kurtz says. Learning to accept the things we cannot change and take action where it is appropriate is not part of is it is recovering from addiction. It is part of growing up. And that's woman. Because I couldn't accept things. When things didn't go my way, I throw my toes out of the cot. I manipulate and I go on and I curse and I blame everybody else. Man. But now that I'm starting to accept things, I'm starting to grow up and be a man. man. And those things are simply the things that I cannot change. And accept the things that I can. Man. Because that comes with surrender, ultimately. Many of us children, we're still wanting to have things go our, our way without regard for anything else. Often this means that we go through a painful adolescence in the rooms, whatever our age. Maturity comes to us when we use spiritual principles rather than defects to deal with reality. I cannot let pride stand in, in the way of me today, man. Because you know where proudness got me, pride got me oh, into situations where I couldn't defend myself anymore. Incorporating principles into our lives allows us to understand the difference between right and wrong. Many of our most crippling defects become powerful assets when we go of self-centered fear. Many times in our addictions we experience a moment of clarity. What we had become. But that awareness in itself did not bring change. So it simply means I can sit here, or I could have said, you know, I have a problem. But I've not accepted that the only solution to my problem is recovery, obviously. And obviously telling people, now nah, I know I need to change, but I'm not doing anything about it. Man. That's why if it is necessary for change to occur, you must be willing to take certain steps, man. This program is not for anybody. It's not for weak people. <laughs> you must be willing to take certain steps to get to the point. But at some of it, we bulk, like Graham said. And he's the great. Because we thought we could find an easier, softer way. <laughs> there are no half measures, man. We stood at the turning point. You can't be half pregnant. Like Mr. Hall says. Some of us say that we are applying spiritual principles because it means we're acting in some particular way. Otherwise, otherwise others of us prefer to say we are practicing principles better at it. However, we say action is what matters at the end of the day. And this is a program of action. Because I can say and talk all the recovery talks, I can talk all the rehab talks, but if I'm not putting in the action or the effort into it, it's going to mean nothing to me. I can know this book from cover to cover that I'm reading, but it will mean nothing to me until I start doing the things that are in here. Our primary action is surrender, and we come back to it every day. There's always room to let go a little more. There's a great freedom in understanding that we always have the option to surrender. In the beginning, we may be confused and think we need to surrender to our disease. But in fact, that's what most of us were doing before we got here. In active addiction, we turned our world over to our disease each and every single day. I was controlled and governed by drugs. Drugs took over my life completely. It doesn't matter who or what you are or what you meant to me at the time. I would do anything to get my fix, even if it means putting you in harm's way. And it can be someone that I care about like my son, because I did do that. In recovery, we learn to surrender to the process, to the program, and ultimately to a power greater than ourselves. And what power is greater than ourselves? That power is God. When we give up the battle, we place ourselves entirely in care of a power greater than ourselves. So I had to surrender. I had to put up the white flag and say, you know, drugs won. It slut me um like Angus said, sitting here in a full night gap, but inside dirty white lips. Spiritual void, I was filling it with all the filth and the dirt, man. 
And I can still be doing the same thing even while you're in recovery when you're starting to eat and you're starting to look fat again but you're not working a program. Because you think you're looking liquor and everything is good and you're looking good and the people say, hey, you're looking fine and you're right and you start scheming in your mind and you start believing that yeah, I am looking good but you're not working a program. That's when you're going down that same road again, my brother. When we give up the battle, we place ourselves entirely in, pay, in care of a power greater than ourselves. It follows naturally that we commit ourselves to the service of that power, however we understand it. Surrender means having the open-mindedness to see things in a new way. And I had to see things in a new way because in a new way I saw hope again for myself. And I still see hope for the still-suffering addict out there as well. That's why I'm sitting here this evening to carry this message because I can't carry the message to you if I myself never had a spiritual awakening. As well as the willingness to live differently. When we open ourselves to the new perspectives, we may find more questions where we had hope to see answers. Each time we can see possibilities that had not occurred to us before. We gain a little more freedom. We are free to change our minds, to change our perspective and to change our lives. Freedom means that we are no longer living by default. And what was that default? Automatically getting up and going to the dealer. Not brushing your teeth. Not dressing yourself. Not worried how you look. Didn't wash for a week. Going to an interview thinking in your mind you're looking good. Sitting there in the interview not smelling good. The people around you don't want to sit close to you. But in your mind you're scheming. You're fine and you're okay. Freedom means that we're no longer living by default. More and more we see how much courage surrender requires each and every single day. It takes courage. It takes a man to surrender. It takes a man to surrender to let go and allow God to step in and take over the will. Because you never did a good job for yourself. It got you into trouble. We see the miracle of recovery in action when an addict we didn't think would make it actually gets the message i was one of those addicts i thought i'm far gone because i work this program and what i found in this program of the spiritual awakening i still see that hope for my sister that is out there that people think will never come back again and I got a lump in my throat when I speak about her. <laughs> That's why it's important for me to carry this message to the still suffering addict out there as well. Because a lot of people thought I wouldn't make it. There's probably still some people sitting there that still thinks I'm not going to make it. But God is in control here and of my life. And He governs my life now. And with Him all things are possible. <laughs> We can see new hope in their eyes. The contrast is so sharp that we can't miss it. We can also recognize the miracle when we find the words of a suffering addict when they need to hear something even though we didn't think we knew what to say to them. We hear ourselves carry a powerful message. We know we are being helped as much as the person we are reaching out to. Finding that we already have the answers we need is like finding a gift on our doorstep when we are having a hard time the best thing we can do for ourselves is to accept that gift by helping someone else that's simply what happened to me when i came back to realm the door is open for me the willingness is still here to help me am i gonna say yes i'll do anything mr all that you want me to do and then after three weeks then i want to say how oh, or simply am I just going to surrender to the fact that, you know, I don't know everything, man. And this evening I sit here humbly saying, I don't know everything and I'm okay with that, man. I'm fine with not knowing everything anymore. What I do know is that drugs and alcohol is going to kill me if I go back to it. And that's enough for me not to go back to it. It's going to take my son with him also. And my son didn't ask to be here. My family didn't ask for this as well. There is hope. There is light at the end of the tunnel. I have of that light today. 
And that's why I carry this message this evening. That's why I carry this message of a spiritual awakening. Because each and every person, whether they are addict or no addict, experiences a spiritual awakening. And those simple things are the spiritual principles like saying please or thank you. Or showing that care for someone else as well. Showing that care for them trying to help the next person as well. Because I found but my next fix before I found this program, before I found God. And because I found that hope for myself, that's why I'm passionate about carrying the message to the still suffering addict out there. Because that person is the most important person this evening. That doesn't know which way to go to. That doesn't know where to get help. That doesn't know what to do or where to, how to go about it. Hey, there is hope for you, my brother. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you to Mr. Hall and Mr. Schuler that the doors are still open to the still suffering addict. That the help is always still here. It's not easy to do what you guys are doing, but because you are obedient to your calling that has been set upon your life, I am one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why I'm sitting here this evening, why I am sober. Because of the time and the effort you've invested in me. And the rest of the leadership as well. And it's only right for me to invest that same time and that same effort to someone that doesn't have the same opportunity that I have as well. That wants this so badly because these people that want help but can't afford it. These people that want help but didn't, don't know what way to go to. How's it all, Rich? Good to see you, my brother. I see your babies growing lekker, lekker. Love to the family. How's it, Joanna Lucas? Ja, ik moet die rookie, ik moet die rookie, I gave up cigarettes, my brother. It's one of the spiritual principles that I practice. Until Graham told me when I started lighting inches again, my bro, stop doing that, you're gonna relapse. And I thought I was better and I knew it all, it's not gonna happen to me. And then I relapse. Because I want what Graham is, but I have to be willing to take certain things. It's always ultimately because of how long he's sober and how long he's clean. Like he says, he's so humble when he says that he's an arm length away from also picking up the, the, the bottle or the drug. But uh, the spiritual principles that he worked in his program and that he still practices today allows him and gives him the best reward of his recovery and that's his mom and taking care of his mother. I want that as well. That when my mother shouts for me or when she can be a dependable person because ultimately when you work a recovery program you become dependable again people start trusting you again people start opening their hearts to you and the doors to you again and to some people that cannot do that anymore to you for me i have to let go of that and move on i cannot hold on the resentment to that because my past actions and my past things that i've done may be cause that they find they can move on with their lives with that resentment and think that about me that's okay I've at least found the light and I hold on to it and I push on and I just persevere and allow God to, to, to step in and take control over there. So yeah, that's, that's all I want to share this evening. Thank you to Graham the Great for letting me use your phone because not one disconnection happened here. Yeah? Vena, you need to upgrade my brother. Still love you. Thank you for the coffee. Love to everybody. Thank you for the support. Thank you to Mr. Hold again. Thank you to Mr. Schuler. Thank you for what REL stands for. Thank you for the support that's out there as well for the Orange Friday. And um, thank you to everybody that watched this evening. I love everybody. I hope you guys are safe in this time. And um, just because it's lockdown doesn't mean that we have to be locked down and open-minded to certain things when it comes to things like online or taking time for God, which is very important. Because that's how we find our spiritual awakening. And I hope through this message that I carried this evening, I could have enlightened and shared awakening with one of you. So I love you guys. Thank you very much.